Shabbat Shalom, my friends, and welcome back to our weekly Torah conversation. Torah conversation about the Sedra of the week. Our Sedra this week is Ki Tetze, Deuteronomy, chapter 21, verses 10 and following. But just a reminder before we start, kind of like a lunar observation. The moon is past full. Therefore, the wonderfully unique late-night slichot service will be held in most places on Saturday evening, September 1st. And thus, with all of that going on, Rosh Hashanah is almost upon us. I pray that each of us is taking advantage of this season of Cheshbon HaNefesh, when we actually run the numbers, gather the facts, and give a hard look at the well-being of our souls. I love that phrase, cheshbon hanefesh, a kind of a spiritual accounting, but not a spiritual accounting so as to get ready for a divine audit from the eternal revenue service, or so that we can come down hard on ourselves and resent our shortcomings, but rather a cheshbon hanefesh so that we ourselves can know where we stand right now. Change is possible. Teshuva, repentance, is possible, but only if we dare to be honest with ourselves. Self-deception is the enemy of personal growth. Self-deception is the enemy of personal growth. And the possibility of personal growth is what makes every day Delicious. Okay, so let's get to our text. Moses' last day on earth. It lasts, of course, a whole book, Deuteronomy. The people are poised at the border of the promised land. There is so much to teach, so little time to complete the task. So should Moses confine himself to the larger themes of what living should be all about for a people in covenant with God? Or should he rather share with us some of the nitty-gritty small details, those daily acts which, like tiny dabs of paint in a pointillist work of art, collectively create a living masterpiece? Moses had a choice. Our sedra this week is filled with 72, count them, 72 such tiny dabs, mitzvot, positive and negative, more than in any other sedra in the Torah. Now, the smallest of these dabs, according to the rabbis, is this. The mitzvah, one of the 613, very smallest, which states that when you are out gathering eggs from a bird's nest, drive the mother away before you take her young. Show compassion for the maternal instincts of birds. Okay. Then there's also, I have to add this, I do it every year, that delightful mitzvah which says that if you have an older child who is publicly disrespectful, a drunk, and a glutton, that child can be brought before the courts and stoned to death. I tried to use that text once in order to demonstrate to my own kids how parental control is actually divinely mandated. That effort, as I recall, didn't go very far. Now, Nechama Leibowitz chose to focus her study of our sedra on this tiny dab. If you see someone's animal that is obviously lost, hashev teshivenu lo. Return the animal to its owner. Okay, fine. And the passage ends, lo tuchal lehitalem, You have no right to pretend that you don't see the problem. You can't hide yourself from the responsibility. You see the animal. You know to whom it belongs. You must return it. And no matter how many times this blessed animal wanders off and you find it, Hashev Tishivenulo, restore your neighbor's property over and over again. A tiny dab. The rabbis drill down. You might think 
that the animal in question had just wandered off for a short distance and there's no big deal in returning the animal short distance. You take, you walk, you bring, you tie it up, you go on. No, no. Even if you encountered that animal far away from its owner, return it over and over again. You may not blind yourself to the obligation whether or not it's what? Easy. Well, okay. Then such a troublesome obligation obviously enforce, is enforced only when you like your neighbor. Surely I don't have to spend my time returning property that belongs to someone who is my enemy, right? What's the point of that? Uh-uh, not so. Way back in the book of Exodus, it tells us that an enemy's property must be returned as well. Again and again, return that animal, despite the distance, despite the owner. And there's more. If you can't find your owner, the, the animal's owner, your neighbor, quickly, easily, then you have the financial obligation for providing for that animal's upkeep. You have to safeguard it, defeat it, no matter what other matters you have on your agenda. We call that a lot of bother. And we can take this tiny meets va apart at four different levels. One level is obvious. Okay, do what's right because it's right. Not just because it might bring us personal benefit, it's right, do it. When we do what's right just because it's right, that attitude can become contagious. The animal's owner might, underline, might just be a little shocked by our consideration and he might remember his own feelings if he then finds himself in a similar situation. I know that that kind of social contagion doesn't always work. Example, just because I give the right of way to a car entering from a side street doesn't mean that that person will then do the same for someone else. We'd hope so. She might. She might not. Social contagion, level one, that's why we do it. Level two, make doing the right thing a habit, the rabbis teach. Behave in such a way that over time we no longer even think about how and why we came to act as we do. It became a habit. We do it just because doing it has become a part of who we are. If we start off doing the right thing just because our parents told us that we had to? Or if we start off doing the right thing just because that's what our sacred tradition teaches us to do? Or if we simply start off doing the right thing because in this particular case doing the wrong thing could end, us, end up with us sitting before a judge? Whatever, all of that is fine. But over time, over and over, habit forms, and that's a good thing. That behavior will become part of the person we are. We become the kind of a person, in this case, who acts with concern. Not a bad outcome. That's a healthy habit. Level two, a third level. Not only must we return the lost animal frequently, but there is an added warning, we are forbidden to hide ourselves, al titalem. To hide ourselves seems somehow to mean that if we don't do it, we think we might get away with it. It just doesn't matter. So let me share with you a truth, just between the many hundreds of us. In the past, I've done some good things, maybe for the right reasons. And every once in a while, I was, I want to use a good word here, mistreated, shall we say, by the person to whom I did the good thing. So why should I bother? What's in it for me? I've had those thoughts, haven't you? Not a good choice. Level three, not a good choice. The fourth level. If I don't do what needs to be done, okay, 
Somebody else will surely do it. There is always a somebody else in the world. They're going to do it. They're going to step in, right? So let them. So long as the deed is accomplished, it doesn't matter whether I was personally involved. Our text would say, again, bad approach. The world doesn't just total up good deeds. The world is concerned with how each one of us acts, how each one of us behaves. Sure, we could leave things for others, and yes, there usually are, thank God, others who will step forward. But that process lessens us as moral agents. Again, not a good choice. When I, it's very personal, when I had hair many decades ago, there was an ad on television for Brill Cream. Now, Brill Cream was a terminally greasy hair cream for men. I left permanent stains on furniture from that hair cream. But the ad went like this, Brill Cream, a little dab will do ya. All right, so today, we've looked at the less greasy little dabs of our tradition. Small matters, of course. But as with Impressionism, those small matters can help create a masterpiece. Little acts of caring. Little acts that demand that we take responsibility. Little acts that offer no promises of eternal life or a really good seat on the 50-yard line in heaven. Caring for a mother bird, caring for a lost animal, acting even though it's inconvenient, acting even though no one else will notice. If we do that, Maybe, just maybe, if others will then choose to act similarly, what we create will be no less a masterpiece than the finest works hanging in a museum. Okay, that's it for this week. Slichot is coming. It's time to assemble our paints and pallets and get to work. But before we pick up a brush and wait till Shabbat is over, be certain to hit share. Have a wonderful Shabbat and a wonderful weekend and work on that cheshbon ha-nefesh.